My friends, I'm just gonna say it. If you are serious about car audio and you wanna take your builds to the next level, or even if you are a newcomer and you want your builds to have that clean, finished look, you gotta have this tool, the router. In this video, we're gonna go through an explanation of what the router is, along with some big tips on how I use the router constantly to help set my builds apart. I'm Mark, welcome to Car Audio Fabrication, the show where together we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. And without further ado, Let's get on into it. This video is brought to you by show sponsor, New Concepts. When you're installing a car audio system, you are often adding amplifiers and that means you need an amplifier install kit. New Concepts has a wide variety of different kits available depending on your needed wire size or even if you are running more than one amplifier. I've been using their wiring kits for many, many years long before I even started the channel. If you guys wanna learn more about them, check out the links down below. So just in case you've never seen my videos before, what the heck is a router? What does it do? Why do we even want one of these anyway? Well, first off, let's focus on the why. Having a router allows us to create extremely clean lines and geometry like this using templates. The templates are all these gray things from my other show sponsor, Mobile Solutions, that you guys always see all over my different walls. Now, the templates aren't the only thing that we use the router for, though. There's a ton of other uses. I'm gonna cover some of them in this video. But just as another example, check out this beauty panel that I built on the channel before as well. This was also built using the router. So what does the router actually do? So the router is essentially just a motor here that's going to spin on this axle, if you will. And we can load a bit into this location here, which will thus spin the bit. The ability to use different bits is what makes the router so powerful. There's so many different things we can do with a router because we have all these different options. Now, a router can be used like this, where we would load a bit into the collet and then we would flip it over and then we would use it in a handheld application, obviously moving it around by hand. We'll talk about some of the reasons we would use it in the handheld application in a second here, but the other application that I use it for quite often is in its table mounted application. In this orientation, you can see that the motor is mounted inside there. And in this case, rather than having handles attached to the motor, it has a router lift attached to the motor. And what that allows me to do is I can raise and lower this bit out of my work surface, which allows me to make a different depth of cut into the workpiece or to adjust for different size bits. Now, my favorite router to use is this one right here. This is the Porter Cable 890 series. And I did a full review about this router here on the channel. One of the really nice features that it has is it actually detects a load. So as you're putting wood into the bit, it detects that load and it increases the current going to the motor to ramp up so that you don't really ever bog down. This is especially nice for when doing big cuts with some of the bigger bits. But unfortunately, my dudes, it seems like they're starting to phase this router out. I don't know what the deal is, if it's a problem of getting parts right now in the current manufacturing issues, or if they're just discontinuing it altogether. So I do have a good other recommendation for you guys. And it's this right here, this Bosch router. I'd like to do a full review video about this. So let me know if you guys would like to see that review video. But in the meantime, if you guys wanna check out links to these, you can check them out in the video description. So what is some of the basic functionality of how we use this router. I mean, obviously it's gonna have an on off switch that we only wanna touch once we are ready to make our cut. And obviously you would have to plug in the wire there. But what about some of the other features? Like what about the speed control here? And um, how do we put a bit in? Let's start with that. I might as well teach you a little bit about the router lift as well. This has separate different throat plates that are different sizes based on our bit size. We remove that out of the way and we unlock the up and down motion. And then I can twist this, which allows me to raise up the bit. I can then use these two wrenches in opposite directions in order to loosen the collet. As far as router bits go, they might look similar and do the same thing. In this case, these are both spiral flush trim bits. So they both have bearings on top. They both have a spiral flute cutter down below. But the difference here is you can obviously see that this one is larger than this one. So this is a half inch shank and this is a quarter inch shank. These are definitely the two most common shank sizes here in the States. 
So as you may have guessed, in order to accommodate each of these different shank sizes, we need different size collets. So this is a half inch collet and this is a quarter inch collet. So this is definitely something to pay attention to. And that's one of the reasons I like that new Bosch router and that old Porter cable router that I have several of is they have these different size collets. You have to be careful because there are some routers out there that will only let you use the quarter inch shank bits. They won't let you use this half inch shank. For the sake of our illustration, I'm going to be loading in this roundover bit and this has a half inch shank. So we're going to need this half inch collet and what we're gonna do is just put this on hand tight. We're not gonna go any past that. Now we can load the router bit in, and this is the first mistake that you want to avoid. I see a lot of people where they push this all the way down against the collet, and you want to avoid that because usually these router bits, they have a little bit of a round right here on the bottom, and what that can do is if you push this all the way down into the collet, it can make it so it doesn't tighten correctly on the router bit. So what you want to do is go all the way down and then just come up slightly, maybe you know an eighth of an inch or so, and then we're gonna tighten this a little bit more by hand, and then we can use the two wrenches to completely tighten it down. I can put my little crank in, and I'm going to crank this down, and for something like a roundover bit, we're gonna to want to get it to the point where this tip right here on the roundover is perfectly flush with the edge of the table, and the way to do that is you kinda of just get your eye real close down here, and you eyeball it and make sure that it's perfect. And then before you ever cut your work piece that you're working on, this is why I like to always keep some scrap pieces of wood right here. You can grab this and you can see I've actually done it a couple of times on this one. Grab the piece of wood, scrap wood, and just test your cut and make sure that that bit isn't raised out of the table and leaving a groove. If we're using the router in the handheld application, we have a similar adjustment to what this is doing where it's raising up and down. We can raise this motor up and down off of this surface here. And the way we usually do that is we'll release some sort of locking arm. And keep in mind that generally the more that you're willing to spend on a tool, these kind of things end up being a lot nicer in their design. So I really like the design on this one. It's kind of hard to do one-handed, but you can see how it's adjusting the relationship of this surface to where the bit would be loaded as I crank it there. You see that it has some adjustment value. So if you did want to make a slight adjustment, you know you're doing so and then you can lock it in position. Now we'll talk about why I like having this in the table mounted orientation in a second here, but what kind of applications would you use this in its handheld application for? Well, one example is you could use a jig like this that attaches to the bottom of the router. This is called the perfect circle, and you can see that it has a little pin right there, and that if we loosen this knob, the location of that pin in relationship to the center where the bit would be, we can change that by sliding it along. So what that allows us to do is we can lock this down by determining a distance for our radius of a circle. We can drill a hole in a piece of wood, push that pin into it, and then as we turn on the router using a straight cutting bit, we can rotate it around and cut a perfect circle. A similar tool to this is the Jasper Circle Guide. In this case, rather than having a pin that slides back and forth, you can locate the size that you want you put a pin through one of these holes and otherwise it works the same. Now there's some other really cool tools you might use this for in the handheld application. One is this, this is the smart ruler from Mobile Solutions. The way this tool works is you take one of these guides and these guides will fit into the bottom of our handheld router part here and we can lock that in with this locking ring and what will happen is we take this tool and we set it on top of a workpiece. So imagine the side of a subwoofer box or the front face, something that we're trying to add some detail to and what we can do is we can plunge a router bit using this down into the material and we can cut these parallel lines. So as an example, that allows us to make little cutting passes like this that add detail on the front of a box. And as a quick side note, understand that a lot of these tools have multiple uses. I might not be talking about them in this video. I do have several videos on the channel about how to use each of these different tools that I'm talking about, but I'm just trying to keep things brief so that we can cover as much information as possible. Now you might be wondering, Mark, where, wait, 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 slow down, Mark. Where did this thing come from here and why is it different than this? So this is a fixed router base and this is a plunge router base. So the difference is on the the fixed one, we lock our fixed position and we're good to go. And on the plunge base here, 
If we load the motor in, we can actually plunge down into the material. And again, this is hard to do one-handed, but we can plunge down into the material and we can lock that tab right there, which locks our height. We can make our cutting pass. And then once we're done making our cutting pass, we would release this with our thumb and it goes back up. You're gonna find for the most part that most routers will come with a fixed base and then you can upgrade and add the plunge base or I definitely recommend looking out for the combination set that has both the bases included. If you're on a budget, you don't have to get this at first. You can make do with just the fixed base, but I definitely recommend upgrading to this when you can because it just makes the process a lot easier. On a fixed base, you're gonna have that bit sticking out and you have to kind of carefully push it down into the material and hope it doesn't wander around on you. Whereas with this, you can make sure you're in the perfect location, plunge down in, start your cut, finish your cut, plunge back out, and you're good to go. Now let's talk about router speed. Now this is something that all the woodworking groups, I feel like they just worry too much about it, to be honest. It's something to consider, but it's not the end of the day. Like if you're making a panel and you did it at 23,000 RPM instead of only 21,000 RPM, you're literally not going to notice any difference. And the reason for that is because this isn't like a CNC. With a CNC machine, you need to control the bit speed, but you're also going to control your feed rate. In other words, how fast the machine is actually moving around. And in that case, you do want to know that your speeds and feeds are correct because you're allowing the computer and the motors to control the two. But in our case here, we control the feed rate. So we're not a machine. We're not like trying to push a board through as fast as humanly possible. We're just going to feed it at a nice rate so that it makes a nice clean cut. So for the most part, don't be too worried about your speed. The recommendation I would give you here is that for when you're using smaller router bits like this, it's good and safe to go up to the max speed, but when you are using much larger router bits like this, it's not safe to have it at that max speed. So in that case, you would likely wanna turn it down a little bit. If things start to sound like they're vibrating or going crazy, then you know that's too fast, you need to turn it down. Now, what situations are we going to want to use the table mount router? And this is where all the different router bits are really going to start to come into play. The first situation that I use it for quite, quite often is copying shapes. When I made this shape here, I used a router template and I used a flush trim bit. The way I made this is I used double-sided template tape. This is just a double-sided sticky tape. I put it on to the router template, I stick it in place, and then by using a flush trim bit that's set at the correct height, these bearings on top, they can spin freely, so they're going to ride against that surface for the template, and then the cutting flutes down below are going to cut the wood. Now again, this is just a really brief description of this. If you guys wanna see this in a lot more detail, definitely check out my builds on the channel because there are a ton of really cool techniques that you can use to oversize and undersize and make male shapes and female shapes so that things fit together perfectly. I go into all that detail on my different builds. But like I said, there's more benefits to the router than just making crazy shapes. Another example, let's say that I have two boards for the front of our subwoofer enclosure. That's pretty common that you want to double up that front face that has the subwoofer hole cut out in it. That way the front is good and strong. And let's say that we've cut those two pieces no matter how hard we try, a lot of times those two pieces are not going to be perfectly square. They're not going to be the perfect exact same size unless we have a really, really good table saw setup. So this is a way that a router can help you get a lot better precision, even if you have some of the cheaper tools like a cheaper table saw, or even if you're using a handheld circular saw or something like that, here's a cool trick that you can use using the router. So what you could do is we know we want these two pieces to be exactly the same. If they were going to be permanently mounted to each other, we could use glue and screws and secure them together or brad nails. If they weren't going to be permanently mounted to each other, we could use template tape. But the point is we can stick these two pieces together with their edges carefully lined up and then we can go through with the flush trim bit on all the sides flip this over and do the exact same thing again. And what that's going to do is that flush trim bit is going to take off that fraction of an inch and it's going to make our pieces 
perfect, like so perfect that even if you had a really, really high end table saw, you wouldn't get the same result because it's literally a perfect copy. Using that copying technique really comes in handy for the sides of a box. If you make each side exactly the same, what that will do is it makes it so that as you put each of these boards on here, they are perfectly square because each of these sides matches. Another cool little box building tip is as you're constructing the enclosure, imagine that this top piece here is just a hair oversized. I'm sure you guys have seen that quite often. It sticks off the edge and then you're like, okay, I wanna make it nice and flush. So you're sitting there and you're messing around with sanding. You don't have to do that with the router. Say that this board here was your side of the box and that's your top piece sticking over slightly. You could bring it over here to the router table, load in the flush trim bit, and you're going to get rid of that extension hanging over. Now something to definitely pay attention to when you're using a router in its table format here is you wanna have an understanding of which direction the bit is spinning. That's why I have all these arrows that I've put on these throat plates here, just a reminder to myself, because when you're feeding the workpiece into the bit, you want to make sure that you're feeding against the rotation. So imagine that this bit is spinning in this direction. I want to feed against the rotation, that way I have control. If I were to feed this way, what's going to happen is that bit is going to literally steal the piece out of my hands and it's going to throw it violently. So that's why you have to always be super careful and safe with the router. If you're getting started and learning how to use a router in a table application like this, this is a must have tool because this is a lot cheaper than a trip to the emergency room. This is a router safety shield. The way you use this is you again use that template tape and you can stick this to the shield. We stick it to our workpiece, and then we have really nice control. Obviously the two would be stuck together, but we have really nice control using these big, large handles. Our fingers are nowhere near the bit, so we're good and safe. And actually I like to use this quite often, even though I'm very familiar with the router, I like to use this because it gives me immense control over the workpiece. So if I'm doing really small, delicate pieces, by using this, I have a ton of control over exactly where the piece is. If you guys haven't caught on quite yet, there is a ton we can do with the router. Let's talk about the different router bits. So these are flush trim bits, and I've already kind of talked about the application of these. They have a bearing on either the top, and the reason I say top when I point to these is whenever we're talking about bearings, we talk about its position as if it was being used in the handheld application. So if this was mounted in a router in the handheld position, we'd have the motor up here, and obviously we'd be doing our work with our bit. So this is a top bearing bit. I know that that can be confusing for new people. Everyone's always confused by it. And these are technically a bottom bearing bit. Even though we're going to see them quite often like this in the router table, the technical term is bottom bearing. So what's the reason for the bearing in two different locations? Well, in cases like this, where you have the bearing on top when it's in a router, even though again, it's a bottom bearing bit, I know it's confusing, but it's on top there, we're going to cut the piece underneath. Whereas with a bit like this, if we were cutting something that we wanted the template that we were matching to be on the bottom and we wanted it to cut something up above, we would use a bit like this. An example for something like this is let's imagine that the piece we were cutting already had a profile on the top of it. That would mean that if we tried to flip it over and use one of these bits here, we wouldn't be able to because it'd be rocking back and forth. So if we wanna cut a contour on the side of it, but it already has a contour in this direction on the top, we could use this bit here because then we can have a template against the table and it's going to cut that template shape on the edge of the piece while the table is matched up to its flat side. By the way, the Mobile Solutions guys and all of us call this the death bit because this is an extremely dangerous bit. You definitely have to be careful with this one. You have to be careful with all of them, but this one in particular, because obviously the cutting flutes are sticking up out of the table. Next up we have rabbit bits and my one right here that's missing is currently loaded in the table. And the rabbiting bits, what those do is it's kind of like a flush trim bit, but the bearing is not the same size as the cutting flute. The cutting flute actually sticks out past the bearing. And the advantage of that is we can control based on that distance, how far we are cutting into a piece of material. When I make the side pieces of a subwoofer box, I'll use one of these rabbit bits like this to cut a little notch out of the corner. So just imagine a little square cut out of that corner. And what that does is it gives me some clearance to tuck these materials in. So I have a nice pristine line to cut this carpet 
and have it look perfect when I wrap a box. Next, we have some different profile bits. So these are pretty self-explanatory. They're going to add a profiled edge to a piece of material. In this case, this is a round over bit, so the bearing rides against the surface and adds that rounded edge down below. And these come in all sorts of different sizes. And the other common bits you will see are these. These are chamfer bits, where as instead of a curved shape, it's just a 45 degree. And for the chamfer bits, there's different degree amounts. So this is a 30 degree bit. You can see it's a little bit more steep. Lots of different options there. There's also these, these are a cove bit. So this is basically kind of an inverted round over style. There's handrail bits where this is kind of a sweeping arch, if you will. So tons of options there. There's sweep bits, all sorts of different ways to contour and make a piece custom. Now, before we talk about this one, understand that it's much like the rabbiting bits. It's kind of the opposite where instead of removing material, we want to expand upon material. And that's why the bearings on these oversized bits are a lot larger than the cutting flutes of the bits themselves. So on these, imagine that we wanted to have this shape, but we want to cut it a little bit bigger. What we could do is we could stick this to a piece of material and then we're going to cut it in the router like so. And obviously since that bearing is set off of the cutting flute, we're going to be able to enlarge the size of that cut. So there's a ton of different options here and I'm just scratching the surface, but I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed like you have to get all of these right from the get-go. You can actually do quite a bit with just a few bits. And that's why I teamed up with Mobile Solutions on this bit tray here. This is called the Eco Tray and this has the vast majority of bits that you need to get started. It gives you the ability to do some contours with a round over bit and a 45 degree chamfer bit but it also has a flush trim and a rabbiting bit and you can see that on the top here is a little set screw we can disconnect that and we can take off these bearings and it includes several different bearing sizes so that way we have several different cuts we can do using the rabbiting bit basically giving us similar functionality to this and it also gives us the ability to do several different oversized steps like that kit. The only disadvantage here is obviously you have to spend the time of changing out the bits. That's why it's advantageous if you are a shop or somebody that's going for extreme efficiency when you're building. It is advantageous to have all the different bits ready to go because then you just need to load them and you're good to go. You're not swapping out bearings. But for those of you that are on a budget and just getting started, I gotta tell you, I wish I had this kit coming up, it would have been really nice to have. Oops, almost forgot to mention too, these are all at a quarter inch shank. And the reason that that is really nice is if you do get one of those lower budget routers that does only have the quarter inch collets, you can still use all these bits. This video really only scratches the surface of all the different things that you can do with the router. There's a ton of other additional advanced techniques that I've covered here on the channel. If you don't have a router yet and you wanna get your own, definitely check out my recommendations down in the video description. Don't forget next time you are installing an amplifier, you're gonna need that wiring kit, so definitely check out show sponsor New Concepts at the links down below. A special thanks to them along with Bart, Mike, Ali, Jerry, Marcos, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team, and a big thanks to you guys. Thanks guys for tuning in, I appreciate it, and I will see you in the next video, hopefully.